you've crewed on and been captain on uh, many ships that tell stories, historical stories about um, their maritime history. So um, was the Ernestina's uh, history a, a draw for you when you were you know, Absolutely. Her, yeah, without question. I had seen her, uh, the first time I had seen her in 2003, which was just about the end of her sailing career out of New Bedford. And I think I saw her again in 2004. Was we would on the Sullivan when I was the mate, um, and then when I was captain of Unicorn, we would always stop in New Bedford, and so that was the first time I'd seen her, and she was looking pretty rough back then. So I was so first so excited that uh, that she was getting some work done because her mm -hmm. history and her pedigree is just amazing. Um, like I said, I did all that research for my my talk last night, and I, I didn't. I did not realize how well documented this vessel is other than like maybe the constitution. I can't think of another vessel in the U S wooden sailing vessel that has so much documentation on her. Mm. So many books have been written about people's experiences on board. Mm. And the, the different chapters of her. Yeah. Her all of her, mm. Yeah. All of her lifetime. Um, I, I of course put the book away, but the one book, um, Phoenix of the Sea, kind of talks about each one of her evolutions of life and now becoming a sail training ship for an academy. Mm. It's a, it's a good book. Um, let's see. Um, so what's your what's your vision for the ship as she you know starts this new chapter? Yeah. So um, obviously, being at the maritime school, getting it, uh, the cadets on board that's that are maybe, well, obviously the cadets that are going for their licensing, whether it's an engineer or a deck license, um, getting them on board. I'm slightly uh, biased, but I feel like a tall ship lays down the best foundation for the maritime industry. All of the, my crew that have sailed with me and that have moved on to other sides of this industry said that they learned so much mm -hmm. um, because we're right there out in the element, you're asked to do things really quickly, like tie your knots. And so obviously using the ship to lay down that good foundation with the cadets at the academy, but also hopefully getting a program very similar to what Maine Maritime has with the Bowdoin, where the science program mm -hmm. will then can offer, it's called a limited license program. So, you know, your, your 200 ton or less captains position so that helps market them in the, if they're going for research and or law enforcement in that in that regard marine mm -hmm. law enforcement having that license is definitely marketable to those people starting out well that's interesting i didn't think of the law enforcement aspect yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's yeah if you think about all the the research and the law enforcement that are patrolling and making sure like you know that with uh, during the still wagon bank and the whales are moving that people are staying within the speed limits and the areas and mm -hmm. you know so there's there's a lot of opportunities for somebody who has a science background and have a license to get out there mm -hmm. well certainly with the right whales in uh, cape cod bay speed limits right. are an important important yeah. well enough not just there but yeah. they, they vacation there like <laughs> right <laughs> can you blame them <laughs> yeah no. it's a little warmer <laughs> um well how about uh, the aspect of like um you know the community uh there'll be a community facet as well right correct yeah that, and that also intrigued me it was part of the reason um uh that i applied for the position when i first started out being captain um I didn't necessarily enjoy day sales. I don't know a lot of captains that actually do, <laughs> but I came to a conclusion. I either can just hate doing this every day or I can just learn to love it. And I actually learned to love at least the aspect of meeting all the people and hearing why they've got, they wanted to be on board. Um, mm. And then, but my personal favorite is teaching young, young people, mm. you know, the, the little fifth graders coming out. And most of them have never been on a boat, let alone, on a traditional boat, getting them out there, just opening that little glimmer of possibilities. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was an important part of Ernestina when she was still sailing. Right, yeah. exactly. So, you know, she's, I think I'm going to be very busy in the future. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I remember uh, I, I did go out once um, 
uh, on an actual sale as opposed to kind of the harbor thing uh, right. for, the, for the fireworks on 4th of July. But uh, it was a, like a Labor Day weekend and it was a day sale, like you say. And we set off and everybody, it was a nice warm day on shore, you know, <laughs> yeah. everybody's got shorts and t-shirts and nothing else. And I, we, my husband and I are boaters, so we came prepared and uh, they were, you know, they were all like huddled <laughs> trying to stay yep. warm. It's like a lot cooler out on the water than you might expect, but it was a great, yeah. it was a great breeze that day. So it was, it was a good sail because we weren't That's just, good. Sort of, yeah. weren't just sort of slouching along. <laughs> um, um, so speaking again about the cadets, you know, what, what is going to be uh, like their more, most valuable lesson that that they'll learn um, spending time? Um, it's hard to say. I haven't really had a lot of time to talk to the deck department um, and the Marine department or the Marine engineering department to find out how they feel that we can use the ship to help, you know, uh, again, lay down that foundation. But I think one of the, the things that cadets will take away situational awareness because mm -hmm. I've worked on research boats. And so when you're inside and it's air conditioned and it's comfortable <laughs> or heated, you know, you kind of just, it doesn't keep you in that sharp mode all the time, but when you're out in the elements, the mm -hmm. entire watch, so you, depending on what kind of watch system you're doing, you know, that four or five hour watches, you're out in the elements and you, you see the weather developing a little bit quicker because you're experiencing it firsthand. So situational awareness, I hope, is their biggest takeaway from their experiences mm -hmm. on board the, the Ernestina Morrissey. Mm -hmm. And I suppose you'll be a, a role model in your, uh, I don't, how would you, I don't know how you would say it, your command of the vessel. Um, I hope so. I mean, I try to lead by example. I, I'm definitely one of those captains that will still help do dishes at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel I'm so important that I can't help clean the boat. You know, if I have other important captain jobs that require me to be there and not help out, um, I will go do those obviously. But if I have time on my hands and I'm watching the crew and the cadets do dishes, you know, uh, I, I like to joke with the, my crew and students from the past is before I was a captain, I was human. <laughs> People yeah. kind of put captains in this weird realm of like, <laughs> first we're infallible and we're unapproachable, mm. you know, cause that was, you know, but there is a hierarchy at the Academy for, cause it is a military school. And so we'll, we'll keep up to that at the appropriate times without question. Right. Um, you know, when I'm on deck, it's captain Crewan, you know, well to the cat, cadets it'll always be that but like to my crew they call me tiffany when we're not in a working mode and uh, mm. social or we're done for the day yeah um, um so i i hope that makes a role model out of that you know uh we're all in this together there's a great course you have to take to get your upper level license called bridge resource management mm -hmm. and that big takeaway from that is if you're the captain of the vessel, you have all these resources in your people to help you make good decisions. Although ultimately it is on the captain to make the decision. However, you know, mm -hmm. um, you have these other people that might have some really good insight or seeing it from a perspective you don't. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's why I try and make sure I'm approachable and try not to get that, that attitude. Yeah. The sort of my way or the highway. <laughs> yeah. Because then when it does go bad, and it will, it's inevitable, it's you're out in a marine environment and a storm will come up or you'll have a mechanical failure or something like that. You know, we're a team, we're all in it together. And mm -hmm. I may not know the best best way to resolve that situation. Mm -hmm. so. uh, do you actually have a classroom role as a, like a faculty member or are you considered not faculty? Um, I'm considered administrative. So like the, I'm in, I'm with the Dean. Um, he's my immediate boss, uh, James McKenna, and then he reports to the provost. So I'm, I'm at the administrative level of mm -hmm. it. So I'm not faculty, although I do hope someday to help teach, uh, courses like the basic safety training mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Cause I really love safety. It's, if, if I had to geek out over something, I, I, I really love learning about safety and knowing how everything works and then, and then educating people about, you know, different safety equipment options, proper use, mm -hmm. proper storage, proper inspections. Um, 
Yeah. So I, I hope to teach that. I'm sure once this comes out and they, they hear that, I've already talked to the Dean about it. He's <laughs> excited too, but I think it'll, the Academy will also be excited. Well, it, you know, it's sort of a, a safety is job one, right? There's nothing, yes. nothing more important. Um, exactly. It's not, it has nothing to do with my pride as everything with getting the people back on shore safely and getting the vessel keeping. Somebody described a captain's job as um, first keeping the water out and keeping the people in. <laughs> it, it sums it up a bit. You know, there's yeah. obviously a bit more to it. Um, it's very but, good though. <laughs> and easy yeah. to remember. <laughs> yeah. The fundamentals. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, some people in New Bedford area are still smarting at the loss of the um, Charles Morgan. Uh, yeah, back in 1941, and it was a it was a, a an amazing day when she came sailing back into the harbor. You know, um, to a to a wild reception. <laughs> I, I'm sure. <laughs> so. What would you say uh, to those who fear that, you know, Ernestina Morrissey is kind of losing her connection to New Bedford? Um, I would definitely distinguish the, that thought in that she's definitely committed to being in New Bedford. Um, she's going to win her there for sure. And then also in the legislation, there's a requirement for us to service the youth of the area. And again, that's kind of where my heart's at. Um, working with college students is kind of like a new realm for me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, nobody likes change. I'm really good at the public thing and I'm really good at this you know, younger student thing. So the college thing is new for me and figuring out how to integrate that. But um, I selfishly want to make sure we're getting the, the young students out there and opening up their world a little bit. So I, I, I hope people don't continue that fear if that's the outcome, you know, it's mm -hmm. still New Bedford's boat without question. And that's, that's our home port. Yep, that's right. what Officially. says on the back of her stern. And Officially, yeah. That's where I live because the boat's <laughs> there, going yeah. to be there quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yes, I'm sure people will be <laughs> happy to hear that because it's sort of, you know, a case of, you know, out of sight, out of mind and some, to some degree. Right. Um, since she's been gone so long. Right. Um, and that, that, just briefly, that, fact that she's been gone so long but people are still so heavily involved and concerned and um excited about her is fabulous i uh, i grew up in erie pennsylvania which has the brig niagara so erie and new bedford i would say size wise are very similar they both have a lot of ownership of their ships and the community at large know about it now when i was in milwaukee for 12 years on the dennis sullivan people every single day would say i had no idea this was here it was oh, like no. <laughs> well, the best okay yeah. the best kept secret um you know there's like in the more than a million people if you count the suburbs of milwaukee plus all the tourism because there's big summer festivals right next door mm. and so it's just it just amazes me how these little communities same with bay city michigan and couple other places these little communities and how much they love their vessels that mm -hmm. represent them yeah it's a, one of those things like um you know every so often you'll hear someone say oh i've never been to the whaling museum and it's sort of how could you how could you possibly not you right <laughs> yeah, well I, you know if you're a school kid in new bedford and you know they're i don't know if there's a certain age at which everybody gets trotted through there or whatever right. but, but um that's interesting to hear um uh let's see mm. so i actually one of my questions was what's your impression thus far of of the support in the community but that was sort of a asked yeah answered. yep <laughs> um, it's, it's amazing it's great you know you walk around just in the little shops down by the, the museum and the waterfront and there's pictures of her everywhere hmm. yeah <laughs> um so yeah, I guess it's sort of pride of pride of place kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. So, so anyway, you have these many years. You've been a captain for twenty four, or is it longer I've been, than that? I've been licensed twenty five years now. Mm -hmm. And what was the license level? You had talked about the different tonnage and yeah. So my first license was for twenty five tons. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then it just it went up to then 50 ton and I, I think I skipped 100 ton and went right to 150 I don't remember anymore mm -hmm. I'd have to get them all out and then um, the Coast Guard was changing a bunch of things so I worked really hard to get in under the old requirements because they've increased the requirements for your 500 ton license now um, and ocean so I just like gangbusters just you know kept going and getting it all done so I didn't have to deal with the changes <laughs> a lot of people did that actually so it's like coursework and experience or it is yep um so a lot of it is coursework certifications like courses like I mentioned the bridge resource management medical care provider medical care person in charge um mm. there's a whole bunch more uh Radar, ARPA, ECTUS, there's all these requirements to get into those upper licenses. Mm -hmm. um, and so now I just need more time on a vessel greater than 100 ton, and I'll be able to have my 1600 ton Ocean Masters mm. without testing again, which would be great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anytime you can avoid testing in my Right. <laughs> <laughs> those tests are not easy oh, at yeah. all. Mm. And that's, you know, there's so many, like you're saying, so many facets to it that people, you know, might not entertain or consider, you know. Yeah. Um, I wonder um, if you've heard about the community uh, sailing uh, school in New Bedford. There's a, a community boating, I forget what they call it, community boating something. Um, I so maybe you can be a, a visitor, a visiting, uh, uh, not lecturer, not like an ongoing, but I'm sure they'd like to meet you and, and say, I started out in, what was it? Little F boats too. Yeah, F little boats yeah too. FJs and Optimists, mm -hmm. yep. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I did, I did uh, learn about them and then did some research on them. I love the, how they grow their uh, instructors from their student pool mm -hmm. and kind of cultivate them. I would love to make contact with them to, you know, maybe those people will make the next step to working on a bigger boat like the Ernestina Morrissey. Uh, the tall ship industry just does not pay. It's just impossible for us to pay like normal wages. Hmm. Um, it's more like stipends. Even my own job, if I were to go commercial, I'd probably make more than twice as much as I make at hmm. the academy. But I personally would not be twice as happy. So, <laughs> yeah. And, and that's, you know, no, it's a passion you know, they, job. They say, love what you do and you'll never work a day in your life. You know, that's another old song, yeah. I guess, but <clears throat> that's true. Um, but, you know, with that being said, mm -hmm. if they wanted to take a gap year or something like that, this is some, it's a great experience to put on your resume because it definitely sets you apart. Like how many people could say, oh, I spent a, a year working on it or a, a full long season working on a tall ship and learning the, the old trades and. Mm -hmm. You know, that really helps set people apart. And that's what I tell the young people when they come sailing for a longer voyage, even a week long, that you've done something, whether you liked it or not, you've done <laughs> something that's very unique. And that's what people want to learn about you when you're going for either schools, scholarships, mm -hmm. employment. Yeah, They want to know what makes you unique. And, you know, getting on a tall ship, you definitely step out of your bubble of comfort there's there's nothing comfortable about them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're always sitting on wood and you have a super flat mattress and you know you have no privacy mm -hmm. so and well, <clears throat> some of the stories i read previously you commented on um you know how they come aboard kind of timid and ill at ease or whatever and they leave uh <clears throat> different yeah i've had lots of parents over the years even my own sister when my nephew did a trip with my two older nephews did a trip with me, just it, it, it changes them a little bit mm -hmm. in a, in a very positive way. Um, more, more understanding what community means. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a lot like a military experience in that, you know, you have somebody who's in the branch of the military and they're with their, you know, division, their platoon or whatever it is. And, you know, that's that camaraderie, which, as civilians, we don't get a lot of that. We work with our people at work, but then we go home. But like in the military and on board ships, you live with those people for a certain amount of time. They become your extended family, as it were. And so, you know, the, the, the community, the, the students seeing the community, us all working together, whether it's a great day or a horrible day, keeping the boat going, 
whatever the direction is, meaning programming or just getting or just point B without us all being seasick and passed out from exhaustion. <laughs> yeah. And <clears throat> hopefully, um, uh, you know, under sunny skies and with fair winds, right? <laughs> That's never the case. <laughs> it's so rare to get like the perfect day in the lakes anyway. They only happen in September and it's only for like uh, a few days out of September that you get the perfect weather, perfect mm. wind, no humidity, unbelievably clear skies. I'm not <laughs> sure what what it's like here. I don't remember. I haven't been on the East Coast in the fall in a long time. So well, fall, you know, later fall, not so great, but the, but September Early. is heaven. Right? Yeah. Okay. So same. Yeah. And and, and uh, well, you know, Buzzards Bay is famous for sailing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's always windy. That's right. So you can count on Southwest right about two o'clock in the afternoon, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Which I find when I walk my dog in the wintertime, not so great, you know, because <laughs> I live on Sconicut Neck. Uh, which okay. I don't know if you're familiar with, but you know, a neck of land and uh, it's narrow enough that I can walk and see the water on either side. Okay. Know, yeah. I've been down there. So, but anyway, so if I go over on the West side <laughs> in the afternoons, it can be rather cutting in the, in the winter time. <clears throat> um, so in all those years of experience you've had out there on, on blue, um, what would you say was your most exciting experience or moment on a ship? Um, well, there, there's been so many, so it's it's hard to narrow it down. Um, the one that comes to mind is uh, when I was racing the Dennis Sullivan on Lake Superior, and I think it turned out to be like a four day race, the whole length of Superior. I don't remember exactly how long it was, but uh, at the start line, this other vessel Europa and I were exchanging tacks and back and forth on the race line. And then we stayed with each other the whole 400 miles or 300 miles. I forget how many miles it was just exchanging. They would take the lead and then we would take the lead. And the Dennis Sullivan is not a fast boat mm -hmm. at all. She's a, she was designed after lumber schooners. So, you know, there, it was all about carrying cargo, not about speed so much. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, um, so it just, and then we won that race. We like, it's the only time that Dennis Sullivan has ever won a race. We got second once too. Um, we usually were like the last vessel, but <laughs> as a, a former competitive racing sailor, I'm de definitely very aggressive at the start line. Cause I know mm -hmm. that's the only time I'm going to shine. <laughs> on, <laughs> huh. Um, probably a little bit more aggressive than a lot of people at the start line that, mm. that, that, you know, just comes right back. Uh, mm. So that's, that's one. Um, that's the one that comes to mind right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so it shows your competitive nature. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I definitely have that side. <laughs> well, Good thing to have. I imagine um, it helps in your business because you're sort of in the minority, right? As a female um, captain, um, that's another thing I was reading in, in those previous articles about the percentages of, of women who are uh, captains in the maritime industry. Um, so I guess that, I, that if the competition characteristic helps in that regard or not but uh it, it must yeah be, it I, must be challenging anyway yeah um that's one of the great things about tall ships in in the maritime industry the tall ship industry side of it is definitely the more liberal uh, mm. uh of all the different facets of of the maritime industry in many ways um you know if you go all the way up to the chief mate position um the it's about 50, 50 percentage of women to men. Mm -hmm. And at the captain level, unfortunately, you know, people make choices to start a family and it, it is hard to do start, you know, having a family and still doing it's hard for men too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they want to swallow the anchor and be close to home and still be on a teleship. Well, those jobs are really infrequent. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's still only about 10%, maybe maybe it's closer to 15% now in the tall ship world for captains. Um, 
But again, at those lower levels, it's about 50%. But then you compare that to the tug world or the cruise ship world or, you know, uh, research. Research is a little bit better about women, is my understanding. But those other ones are very low still, Mm. you know, 1% or less in Mm. some cases. It's, you know, it's going to take a full generation, uh, I think, before things kind of normalized to yeah. you know gender really isn't a, a factor anymore mm-hmm. well I know you have a daughter who's how old now 12 yeah yeah so does she uh is she following in your footsteps as far love of sailing or um... not at all, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I mean I mean she's I, you know it's one of those things um she's been doing her whole life she mm-hmm. has more sea miles on her than some of my deck cans, mm-hmm. but it's not, it's not her thing. She loves being on the boat with me and, um, you know, everything, but she doesn't, she really hasn't taken sailing lessons. Um, she's into horse riding. Um, oh. and she, she just got, she just bought her first horse. I mean, we've been leasing a horse for years now. They have a really tight bond, but now there's a new horse. Cause I did. I still don't know anything about horses whatsoever. <laughs> I know where the front is, yes. and I'm good. And you know to stay away from the back end. <laughs> I definitely know that. I, but um, you know, the, the horse that she had been riding is kind of maxed out. He's older, so she's into dressage and oh, wow. uh, eventing, jumping, mm-hmm. and so she needed a younger horse that they can both develop. So, mm. yep. Now she has. The horse but she lives with my we call each other co-parent we we separated years ago but you know I'm I go back about every we see each other about every six to eight weeks for a week mm-hmm. so and and so when she's when you're on uh, on the ship she's with your partner or former yeah co-parent, co-parent. yeah <laughs> try to put a positive spin on it um yeah, and then sometimes she, she's come out on the ship with me um, during the pandemic when the, right after the shutdown was lifted in Wisconsin, um, I had bought in a wooden boat and I told myself I would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, um, but it turned out to be a real, really great experience because she needed restored. And um, so every weekend at Friday, Carson and I would go up the boat was about 80 miles due north from us and we would stay on the the boat all weekend even though she was out of the water and so it was like camping every single weekend and I would Mm -hmm. you know she would help me do some little some little of the restoration and I made a really great friend um Alex Nymphius the family that built my vessel is still in business and he remembers building her for the she's only had one other owner and oh. they got sick and the kids didn't want it. So that's how I ended up with it. Um, you know, it was inexpensive, but it cost me a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, well, as we know, wooden boats, it, this, well, Ernestina, case yeah. in point, right? <laughs> yeah. But I can't wait to get my boat out here too. So mm-hmm. yeah, just love boats. Well, we have, of course, our famous Concordia, uh, I guess they're y'alls, not catches. In out of Peyton Aram, there's a. Oh know, yeah, I was. Yep. And people talk about you know, oh my God, what it costs to maintain them. So there's people with lots of zeros after their <laughs> bank accounts that can have those. But right. My husband's father was a um, was a uh, charter captain mostly um, down in the Bahamas, and he had an Alden schooner. Um, okay. Yep. Heron. Um, hmm. And then later on, he was a professional driver for people in in Florida. You know, people in Palm. I always get confused. Palm Beach, not Palm Springs. Palm yeah, Springs Palm Beach. No, yeah, <laughs> Palm Springs has no water. <clears throat> anyway. Yeah, it's a very um, highfalutin area for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. So we got to flip the page here. So the work has been going on up at Bristol Marine for uh, several years, right? I don't know how many years exactly. I believe she, she's she been up here seven years now, seven. or almost seven years. So my several was, uh, <laughs> it was a good one. Yeah. Um, so what's the current status on the... the- yeah, so uh, barring any supply chain situations that slow us down, she should be back in the water this summer and back in the area this summer. 
So oh, great. Yeah. yeah. We so, haven't we haven't done any program planning this year because it's such a moving target. We mm -hmm. you know, with, and now with what's happening in Eastern Europe, uh, Europe, who knows how that's going to affect us too. Mm -hmm. um, Cause a lot of things have been coming from Europe. Luckily, I think all those things um, are here already. So, mm -hmm. but who knows with the, this environment right now? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty with that. Not, yeah. Um, yeah, I was looking into some of the earlier newsletters it, SEMA has uh, released and saw the masts being uh, shaped or whatever. Yep. So, um, so as far as like the systems go, is it are, the masts have been stepped, not stepped, or not stepped yet? Um, so the mast construction is done, and now we're at the point where the hardware we're either using uh, the hardware that were that was on the spars previously, or sometimes we're having new hardware made. It's all custom work. So the drawings are getting done and we're going through all the old equipment to see what, what is in good serviceable life mm -hmm. still, um, and then condemning the stuff that's not. Um, and then we're also uh, installing the AC. So the same kind of power that a house has, your AC systems, and then also DC. So all the stuff that runs off of batteries. Mm -hmm. So that's all going in right now. So lots of chargers, lots of switches. Mm -hmm. um, I've been working with the electrician about placement of certain things to make it easier from a, a captain's, an, an operator's perspective. Mm -hmm. Just because an electrician thinks this is a good spot for something <laughs> doesn't necessarily mean in, in the application world, it, in a tall ship, that's a good spot. Yeah. But this, the electrician's very good. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, uh, I think it'll be a revelation to people when they see the ship again, because Yes, she said she was looking kind of rough, yeah. uh, and now she's brand new. Brand new, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, she had a major facelift. <laughs> <laughs> well, and a bottom lift too. <laughs> yeah, she just had, if we, only if we could get all that kind of work done to us, right? <laughs> yeah. Make us look twenty again. <laughs> yeah. Well, my husband and I were up in Booth Bay. I don't know. Must have been the summer before the lockdown. Everything is BC, right? Before yeah. COVID. Um, and anyway, went out, walked down to the boatyard to see how things were, were going. Um, oh, she looks a lot different now. You probably saw her when she was still just frame and, and deck beams and that. Yeah. But I, you know, I follow the newsletters and stuff. Um, let's see. So you said, uh, launching hopefully summertime, uh, and then yeah, so the ship supporters can expect to hopefully uh, welcome her back sometime in the summer. Correct. Yeah. So there'll be, a, I'm sure there'll be a big party and, and lots of. Uh... Yeah, definitely a big homecoming for, her. I know, um, you know, we've started talking about it again because, but because it's a moving target, you know, there is ear, there's money set aside uh, in the city of New Bedford of is my understanding to have a big homecoming celebration. Mm -hmm. So now we just have to know when that is. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure the community, the Cape Verdean community will be delirious. You know, yeah, deliriously definitely. Because um, it, ha you know, that recent history is really their history. Uh, so, um, well, I've sort of come to the end of my list. I don't know if there's something else you'd like to add about. Um... Um, no, nothing comes to mind. Just I'm, I'm glad we touched on uh, people's concerns of their access to the interesting. If anything, I didn't realize this till I did my talk last night, but they might have more access than they've ever had because she wasn't doing public sailing those last few years, just mm -hmm. Ed stuff. So she will have the certification um, to do small passenger vessels. So taking people out for day sails mm -hmm. as well as doing our, our, uh, educational part. So uh, a ship like that, uh, a sub chapter T in the coast guards, I small passenger vessel. And then she, she has her R certification, which is school ship. So, okay. So, yeah. So I, I, I didn't realize that till last night that people really had never gotten a chance to go on or I'm not sure when she stopped public sailing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the kids 
you know, they can learn a lot. You know, they can learn a lot that's beyond just, well, it's how do you, how do you make the sales rise? You know, what's right. What's what's a pulley do, right? Or a block right. do or <clears throat> that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, the, the simple machines. And mm -hmm. that's what I love about is it's it incorporates every kind of a, uh, aspect of what a school and what you're learning. It's it is STEAM. You know, STEM used to be the big word, but there's so many great books about the sea and sailing ships like the Ernestina, um, both fictional and non-fictional, you know, that just, I, I love that that's the aspect now. And there's so many great artwork out there about, you know, the maritime industry and, and maritime. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, every aspect of, of what you can learn is on a school, on a, on a schooner like Ernestina. 